we want to kind of build on what we've heard over yesterday and afternoon and this morning. And uh, Edo's been giving some thought as to how do we begin to embed some of this thinking and can we use some of these tools and so on within Eori. So he's had a couple of uh, interns working with him to help think through some of these issues. Has put some initial ideas together. I think they are initial ideas, Edo. And you're, you're wanting feedback <laughs> from the from the group here about uh, what you're what you're proposing. So over to you, Edo. Thanks very much. So um, as Ian said, this is work that I've uh, been working on with two of our graduate fellows, um, Nicole Wu, um, who is, <laughs> Nicole Wu, who's uh, based in Addis. Uh, Shane Ryan is. Uh, was based in Addis, worked with us for a few months. He's now taken on another assignment in Rwanda, actually, um, but not with us. Um, and I call that scaling better together. Um, and I'll try to cover our approach and an outline and our principles. So our approach, basically, um, is to leverage existing approaches and tools and adapt that to Ilri's context. And that's also part of the reason why we wanted to have Larry and Leonard and Mark um, speak to you, so that you can hear them and see firsthand where they're coming from. Um, so they are some of the, their tools are some of the tools that we are proposing to, to use, um, but not exclusively. With, <coughs> with the mindset of uh, looking at what's out there, we did quite a comprehensive lit review in the sense of looking at what framework, tools, approaches are happening, mostly in the agricultural sector, but we also looked at health and other, other sectors which are relevant for, for us. Um, so we really tried to cover most of what's out there. We look at stuff that's out there by USAID, the World Research Institute, the IDIA, which is a consortium of uh, donors, IFAD, um, and, of course, some of the tools that you've seen in the last few days, so Wacheningen and IRTA, the CIMIT and CPT, and all, et cetera. We also looked at other things. I'm not going to list all of them. They're, they're up on the screen. We then conducted interviews with the tool developers and with other scaling experts to see um, what they're thinking, where they're coming from, and how that fits into to our context. And finally, we're um, in the process of finalizing an ev our own evaluation of the various tools how comprehensive, how feasible to your other implement, how suitable they are, um, along the lines of certain criteria that we, we map all of these, these tools across. And we also, right at the beginning, looked at, you know, what are some of the principles that we want to make sure are, are embedded into our approach. So flexibility is, is a very important one. So we have a mix and match approach. So um, it will involve the combination of the tools you saw yesterday and today, whether it's the scaling scan, the ASAT um, from USAID, um, whether it's the scaling readiness, and there can be others as well. And that's mostly the point we want to, to stress is that it's not about any given one tool, and tomorrow a new tool may come out. It's about how we use them and have the flexibility to use them all to get to what makes sense. Um, and that may look differently for different projects. Um, also, the use of scaling coordinators to support that process. I'll say a little bit more about them later, um, but this goes back into what Larry was saying about the intermediation, and uh, Mark actually didn't get to that point in his presentation of the science of scaling. There's also, um, they're working on the practice of scaling, which is how do you actually embed and, and run that within a CG center. A third key principle is to keep an agile approach. So we're going to adapt and iterate quickly. We're not going to try to come up with a master plan that captures every possible scenario for every project ILRI could be involved in, but rather capture things that work, that get us to the, the main points we want to see, and if something doesn't work, adapt it and iterate quickly. So don't, don't wait for 30 um, projects to finish in order to fix something that you figure out on the first one isn't quite right. And finally, scaling is a team effort. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes, you know, um, all of Ilri for to make this work. So this is really going to depend on very close collaboration between all of the project teams across Ilri, the impact and scale team, and, of course, with our partners. So I want to 
first up front, we are not suggesting that um, people in the different programs, the different projects, don't know about scaling, don't do it right. Don't do it. That's not where we're coming from. There's a lot of richness and expertise. What we are trying to do is to come up with a framework and a system that would help us do it better, quicker, and more consistently across our portfolio as an institute, um, as opposed to each project doing its own thing with trial and error. Um, in the interest of time, I'm actually not going to spend much time on this slide. Um, some of the tools have been presented. There are others there. We'll have a synopsis document with, with all of those, so I'm just going to uh, move ahead. Um, but I will spend a bit of time on this process diagram, which, uh, which captures the process as we envisage it, and there could be various levels to the process. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It all starts with uh, primary data collection. I'm not sure those online will see it, but, uh, but it's the top on the left corner side. You have a prim preliminary data collection box. That's a step that happens right in the very beginning using a set of structured and semi-structured tools to collect information from key project um, participants about various aspects that helps us prepare for the initial workshop. We envisage the um, initial workshop to essentially build on the scaling scan tool and the agricultural scaling as a assessment tool. Um, which helps us um, take basically the pathway. So we basically like the scaling scan. We think in its, in its process and its flow, the fact that you can do it in a day and a half or two-day workshop, it fits and it helps the teams come together. We like the pathway scale suitability of ACT because it forces us to be much more specific, whether it's a public sector or private sector, and who are the components. That initial workshop will give us enough information to do an initial scanning report. Now, a lot of the things that Mark has been saying about the self-reporting bias or the risk of a self-reporting bias um, would still be there. So this would be basically a short report based on a two-day workshop and some preliminary work. It would stand there. It would help a project that's maybe not really at a scaling phase or is doing it at an early phase knowing that it's not really going to be scaling anytime soon to still be upfront thinking about these things, to have their pathways clear, um, and to have the ability to look at this a little bit more systematically. So if we're doing, this is what we're calling the light review. So projects that would only do a light review, we would basically stop almost there we do a little bit of data validation and follow-up. So if somebody said in the workshop, oh, well, you know, our path is very clear. It's this private sector partner, that they're going to do 90% of the scaling is going to come through there. We may have a chat with them just to make sure that the way they see their role in, in the scaling actually matches the way we saw it. Um, so if we have glaring um, gaps in between, we're saying our scaling is contingent on A, and the person or organization doing it tell us, actually, we're not doing that. We're not planning on doing that for the next three years. We might go back and say, hey, some initial validation say that we, we probably want to go into that. Um, but we won't go into much more than that. That then gets finalized in, in the scaling plan, the initial light scaling plan, and that's where that project would end for that time. They can then decide you know, in a year's time, in two years' time, we want to review this, we want to do um, a next step, but at least that, that's sort of the basic light that we would um, very much advocate for all new large projects to, to go through in order to make sure that we are um, clear and systematic in how we go about this. However, some projects would be at a stage that they say, well, we actually want a deeper dive than just that. And that's where we propose to use the scaling readiness and to go through the various stages. I won't go through them again because Mark just um, went through them in quite some detail, um, but to go through the more in-depth scaling readiness, which is um, has the axis, it has the nine stages, which are actually adapted from NASA. Um, so it's an adaptation of something that's been rigorously tested for many years, and it's just being applied to the agricultural sector. Um, it has more... Um, quantifiable information that's 
designed to be aggregated across projects into programs, CRPs, the Institute as a whole. So we do see a lot of value in that. But we also, you see on the bottom, detailed analysis using other tools, we do recognize that some teams, for whatever reason, would prefer at times other tools, and we would work with them to, to go through a similar process, doing the deep dive using, using those. That would end up with a scaling plan that is um, both much more detailed in terms of uh, the innovations themselves, the environment, you know, the scaling pathways, et cetera, but also would then um, link much more laterally into questions on implementation, monitoring, evaluation, learning, how do you navigate that, and how that, does that inform us going forward. So that's, um, that's the process diagram. I know it's a little bit complex, and I'd be happy to answer questions later, but again, in the interest of time, let me move on. So some of the things that in initial discussions that I've had with, with a number of colleagues, they said, oh, yeah, that's true, but you know we have to have deliverables. And so, of course, we have, we have to have deliverables, and, of course, those deliverables actually should nudge us towards our outcomes and our impact. Um, but just to, to lay them a little bit out here. So we have um, the synthesis of the primary data collection. Um, we would have the initial scaling report based on the stakeholder workshop. Um, for those, um, we keep it as optional, but for those who do the deep dive using scaling readiness or another tool, um, we'd also have a much more detailed mapping of the technology readiness and usages, as well as the challenges and the scaling options. You remember the seven options that, that Mark presented, et cetera. Um, ultimately, the main deliverable will be the scaling plan, which could either be the light review or the detailed version, and that one will incorporate the finding from the overall analysis, which what's our scaling pathway, what are the interventions that are going to address the challenges, What's the partner mapping? And I know we have a number of partner mappings already being done in different contexts with different tools. This is not meant to duplicate um, um, them. It's really with a scaling focus, which are the partners with the scaling focus, which are key, which help us in terms of um, doing the independent third-party verification on some of the assumptions that we have. Um, you will also have some reporting, data collection, verification considerations, and Finally, recommendations for the next step, which then the projects can um, take on board or not, um, immediately or not, but at least they'll have a clear set of recommendations to help guide that work um, moving forward. So what's a timeline? Um, I, want to, I want to sort of be tentative about this because we've not done these, and the way that we're mixing and matching, matching uh, means that it's never been done the way that we are doing it. So we, we, we love ourselves a little bit of, of margin in terms of how long something takes and so on, but we really think that this is um, sort of an indicative. So this is something that we've developed for a project that's supposed to start um, um, quarter four of this year. Then so we have some preliminary data collection um, then the scaling workshop, we then, um, this is a project that does want to do the deep time. We then do the um, initial report, data validation, then the, the scaling readiness, and then the comprehensive data plan. So in all, start to finish from initial project interested in doing something around this to having a scaling plan would take about a year or so if they're doing the full process. Um, obviously, this is not a year of someone working full time on this, um, but in terms of how these things are spread out, it will probably take, you know, a year or 10 months, 9 to 10 months or something like that to really go through the, the entire process. Um, once we actually start going through this, we'll narrow these down and we'll have much more clear um, indication on timelines, etc. So this is pretty much the um, this is pretty much the the initial concept um, that that we had envisaged now in terms of next steps what what would that look like what are the implications so we're planning a small initial rollout four to six projects in 2020 um, the idea is really though and part of why we want to do it now is to start thinking to 2021 and beyond and gradually introduce this as future projects go live. So 
So if today um, 0% of our projects across our portfolio have a scaling plan in place, we might want to come up with some kind of a target. We haven't discussed that number yet of what that should be in 2025, in 2030, and what are the implications of that for how we work and plan and engage with, with our with our investors and with our partners, et cetera. So, what next? Um, if you do, some people might ask me, what are the, the projects? So, I, I purposely don't want to go into that. Um, here, some of them are still being finalized, but basically, if we haven't talked about it, you're not one of the projects, basically. Um, unless something happens in this presentation that completely revolutionized your world and you say, you know, my world will not exist unless I'm part of the initial group, in which case, speak to me and we see what we can do. Um, but basically, this is meant to roll out with a small pilot of projects who are already aware of it and planning for it. Um, if you're working on proposals, for example, for the ILRIA 2025, um, you should plan for an initial light assessment at a minimum in year one, and then use your judgment for estimating what your needs might be. So if you think you will be going into a more scaling phase during the five-year project, um, then leave aside some money, not just for an initial plan, but for the detailed deep dive. Um, Mark gave an example of how they did it in RTD, that in certain uh, flagships, they left money, um, um, a pocket of money to address issues that they knew that they don't know what they are yet, but they something will emerge. So I would encourage doing something like that, using your judgment. And again, if you have questions or if you want more information or if you want to talk through that, um, please let me know and I'll be very happy to, to walk you through it. I do have a few more slides, but in the interest of time, because I know some people need to leave at 12, let me um, stop here and open it up for, for any questions. And maybe those questions will, will take me to the slides anyway. So thanks, and um, Ian, would you chair the questions? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Nido. So that's a kind of very brief outline of, of, of some of the thinking and how we would plan to take this uh, forward. So, um, and I'm sure you know there are maybe many, many detailed questions. But let's begin with you know comments and questions about the kind of the overall approach. And, you know, and then if we get time, we can dig deeper into the specific questions. But, I mean, do you think this is a, you know, a reasonably, a reasonable way forward for building? Um, so let, let's deal with the kind of the overall approach first. So, yes, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Ida. This is, uh, this is a great presentation, and I completely agree that we should, as an institution, and also indeed as, as CG as a whole, we need to focus more on scaling and innovation. Uh, when it comes to scaling and, and say, commercialization of uh, new technologies, innovations, which by default by, are perceived by risky, uh, as, as risky by, by the private sector because it is an innovation. It's, I mean, it's, by definition, it's, it's perceived more risky as other products and technologies that they might be commercializing. From my experience and from my previous jobs, I know that in order to incentivize private sector partners to take on those innovations, there is a need to have um, some incentivizing mechanisms, let me put it this way. Um, concessional uh, financing, for example, which is made available for those companies. This is obviously not something that we do as the only but have you also thought about this? How do we really attract private sector partners? Because we may think that, okay, company X seems to be a suitable partner for us. They could potentially do that. They could potentially work with us. But really, they might not be interested because they perceive the product as risky. They perceive the um, customer segment as risky because presumably it will be targeting the bottom of the pyramid. Companies have relatively little experience in doing that. So there needs to be some set of mechanisms that would incentivize them to work with us. Um, thanks, Polek. So let me let me answer that uh, in two parts. Um, first, ideally, um, we would get to um, innovations that are so compelling that they don't need a lot of incentives for people to take up. 
because the danger with that is that if you have to pay someone to use your innovation, um, it's very difficult to scale something like that unless you have um, pretty much unlimited funds, which, which we don't. Um, and so, um, for example, in the scaling readiness, one of the, on the nine scale, one of the big jumps that for me is very, very significant and interesting is, is someone who's not involved in the project in any way, you're not paying them, you're not supporting them, have they adopted it, and are they using it? That's sort of a big sign of maturity. So I think over the long run, a sign of our maturity would be how much of our innovations that we feel are ready to go out there are actually being taken up without um, heavy involvement or subsidies from Hillary's side. That's the first part of, of, the, of the answer. The second part is that I absolutely agree with you that on some areas, um, we do need to um, establish the case first before um, we can hope for large um, unsubsidized private sector interest. So, for example, financing, which you've mentioned, is a great example. It's a huge bottleneck, um, and traditionally, where you look at the financial services industry, whether formal, such as banks, or less formal, such as MSIs, etc., they have stayed away from the agricultural sector, like the plague, um, because they are afraid of um, high risks, and they're not sure how to handle it. And part of um, where ILRI, and CG more broadly, but ILRI can play a role is piloting small-scale innovation, whether it's with one acre plan, whether it's with other partners, to find out, to demonstrate that this actually has a business case. And how we set that up will be very important. And I do agree that there are areas like that where it would, it would make sense. We have to be very careful to define them well and to define our entry and exit very clearly. Um, so that this doesn't become sort of a, an ongoing thing, but, but I think that there, there's absolutely cases where it makes sense for us to do so. Can I add to that? I think that, I mean, it, I mean, Dieter often gives the example of the, the, the animal health industry, the pharmaceutical sector, and how many of these large multinational companies who are sometimes also in the, in the healthcare sector, uh, view the agricultural sector, the animal health sector here in Africa as risky because the healthcare business is much bigger. And they are afraid of running the risk of, you know, false products and they get a bad name and that kind of ability to protect only a much bigger healthcare sector. So I think the question of, 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 of risk and risk averseness is, is important. However, we've got to remember that the private sector is very homogeneous. <laughs> Heterogeneous, sorry. <laughs> it's not just the big multinational companies. You know, the, the report last week that the Zagra produced by Tom Reardon called The Hidden Middle shows that there is a huge investment from the small and medium-sized enterprises across Africa. And Kenya is a classic example of that. So maybe it's not a big multinational company that we're thinking about. Maybe it's a small and a medium-sized enterprise here in Kenya or in Ethiopia or whatever, okay? Um, but of course, ensuring that, you know, we can help them de-risk by access to finance and so on as part of it. We have some experience with that. If you look at Italy, a lot of what we're doing now is talking to governments and, 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 and um, investors and so on. How can we de-risk some of the investment in Italy for the private sector insurance company? So, you know, we're already, we're already, doing, we're already doing some of that, but we need to build on, or build, build on that. And as Edo points out, many of the tools there are, 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 are designed to help you identify what some of those bottlenecks are. And some of those bottlenecks are risks we can't address, but we can engage with other organizations or companies or government to help deal with those bottlenecks and, 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 and risks. So I say we have some examples of where we're beginning to do that. As, as, as we uh, uh, hey, who, who, someone uh, on the line, please go ahead. Welcome. Hi, it's Peter Thorn here from, I'm from the UK. Oh, hey, my Hi, Peter, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of things uh, we could discuss here, but I think um, one of the things I'd like to highlight is the question of um, how do we demonstrate our success? And I think uh, most of the speakers have kind of alluded to the issue of time scales around this, and uh, getting to the stage you know, that Mark sort of idealized this morning of uh, users having taken up these innovations via 
secondary organisations, tertiary organisations, some way beyond the kind of proof of concept, evidence gathering, validation, or whatever you call it. This does not happen overnight. This is we're talking about things that are going to happen perhaps five or even ten years or beyond that after the end of the main engagement of the research. So, I mean, I, I, I like the framework that you're presenting it in, and obviously that's going to evolve as you have experience of applying it. But do you have any provision within that to actually, for us to be able to go back to our donor later on and say, look, um, this is what we've achieved. This is where we've scaled. This is our hardline scaling uh Scaling partners have invested in this. I think that's another good indicator that if a scaling partner is willing to invest their own money in promoting their technology, they don't require project support. Uh, that's a kind of similar level of indicator to this independent uptake. So that's my question. How do we embed that in our, um, but it's a monitoring and evaluation question, really. It's not about attribution, it's about contribution, but we need to be able to have generate those numbers at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah. So I completely agree. Um, it's, it's a very valid point. I don't think that um, I have a great answer about this today. It's something that we are thinking of. All of these tools have sort of their own um, m and and follow-up uh, sort of tools. And we're still giving that thought. Um, I think some of the... I, I expect you to have a great answer. Um, I, I wouldn't have a great answer. I, I, I don't think Mark would have a great answer, but I think it's something for us to think about early on. Yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree. Um, I, I'd answer this with, with sort of a question, you know, answering a question with a question, which, um, you know, is, is what do people say today when you ask them about these things? And I would, I would say that my experience has been that, you know, many, not all, but many of our colleagues would say, Oh, the private sector would do that. We don't need to question how it's done. Um, and I think that that's maybe part of the issue, that we don't have good mechanisms today for actually our tracking how our past innovations from 10, 15, 20 years ago have been taken up, what was the process, and therefore what can you ex expect from a project which is at, you know, a piloting stage based on the numbers and based on the context, what can you expect it to do? I think that we can ultimately um, come up with better prediction and modeling around these things. Um, and we have a lot of in-house um, expertise in that, um, not in my program, but in, in the other programs, rather. Um, and I think that that would be important to, to leverage and to think about more. Um, but that's, that's as, as good an answer as I can, as I can give today, Peter. All right. I, yeah. I mean, I... My, I'm really urging you to sort of have your eye on this as you move this forward, I think. Uh, and I agree, a sort of historical analysis would be a, a very good starting point because we can at least give evidence that it, it has happened, hopefully. Um, but I think predicting for the future is likely tricky. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Isabel, you, you have a point? Yeah, if you just could uh, go back to the first diagram, uh, just... Uh, for me to better, I mean, for people to understand my question. So I was just uh, wondering about these, um, yeah, I think so. There's something before? No, I don't. No, 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 the next one, sorry. So I was just, I was just wondering about, uh, so you, you, you mentioned that the tools, we've seen a couple of tools the last days, so we will have to adapt them to the livestock, uh, yeah. So I think, I think a couple of people in different programs, they want to have input into the, into the tools. So I, I don't want to use the word champion to use them because of the end, but a, a program contact person possibly would be a, a, a good idea. Um, you know, when that person would be the link as well as that. So that you don't have a, a stronger connection between the different research program and impact of tech could be one, one way. We obviously very care to are not just like let's meet and have uh, coffee, but uh, possibly having you know, a draft tool to comment on and, and things like that. That would, I get, I, as well, get buy-in from the rest of the institute. The person would be in charge of convincing his or her own program, by the way. That's one, one way. Um, and then, for the four, four to six projects that you are, you are thinking about testing that, yeah, looking at, you know, how, what would be the lesson after six months, one year, just for that group possibly as well, so that you don't get, 
we need that consistency as well and people drawing from it. So just that's just as as uh, a suggestion. And then something that we briefly discussed about I wasn't very clear, uh when the Uganda country meeting about about TOC. The TOC is a, it's a fair of change approach for me it's about this end in mind that I've uh, maybe I was only hearing that I wanted to hear but I heard that a lot last two days about getting the end in um and keep, keeping the eyes on the price and starting with the end, end in mind, right? And uh, it, when you start engaging with a, uh, in, a, in a community or a country on a specific innovation, always starting with, okay, what what if I, if I, end, if I exit tomorrow, what, what will happen? And for me, the TOC helps into, into that. So I was as well wondering how this scaling plan could be integrated in a, in a, in the, in the, in the, like, sub country country, uh, TOC, so that it reminds people who will implement the, the project that this end in mind, I think, is very important if we want to go towards a scaling, a scaling up, a scaling outcome. So I wasn't sure you, you, we got it right last time when I was on, on, on WebEx. But that was my idea, it was not that TOC replaces that, it was not about, like, strengthening the, are you at all the TOC to that you already use and more or less people seem to get more, more and more familiar with? How can we use it, at least in some programs, use it to to get this process as well more and more aligned? Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. So on your first point, I very much welcome that, you know, to have, because um, the way we envisage it for now, the scaling champions, to use that word, would be each time within a project team who would be the person which is different, as you rightly point out. But in addition to that, to have um, each program nominate one or more, you know, the more the merrier, I have no, you know, it's like it's, it's an open thing. If, but to have people uh, provide uh, feedback on the approach, draft tools, etc., also group feedback after the, the initial set of projects, very open to that, very welcome that. Because um, I think it would also help create this sense of joint ownership, which I think is crucial for this to work. So, I mean, I have seen in some some emails, you know, Ido's baby. Um, and for this to be useful, it has to be, you know, Ilri's baby, not Ido's baby. Um, and, so, and so I very much welcome that. I think it will be very good. To give you a bit more um, um, uh, concrete answer, we are aiming to have a lot of the write-ups both about the tools, the synopsis, but also our outline, our process, who does what, etc., ready by the end of this year. And so in a month or two, probably two towards uh, two months or so, um, we'll be able to share that, and we can use the time in the interim to create a small sort of uh, uh, internal group on that. So on that point, you know, absolutely, and thanks for suggesting that. Um, on the theory of change, I'm happy to work with you to, to see how, how you envisage that in, in, in general. Again, very open to this if it helps um, improve some of our other processes and embed better into them, I'm, I'm all for it. I was just a little bit, and I may be at times a little defensive um, about this in the sense that it's so new that it needs to sort of have the, the liberty to, to do these things, sort of uh, to run through the, the standalone process at least once or twice so that we we know better what we want this animal to be before we start sort of completely embedding it. But I see no harm in, in using the time to, to work, for example, on the Uganda um, TOC or another as an example and seeing where, where that takes us. I would have thought on a theory of change. I mean, yes, I agree, you know, the theory of change approach with starting the end in mind is going to be important here. But I can also see uh, an opportunity to link this because many of the assumptions that we build into our series of change actually will map onto some of the bottlenecks yeah. <laughs> that these tools identify. So I think there's a, there's a strong touch point yeah. there, right? Yeah. Because we, we have those assumptions in the series of change, but often we don't think about, well, what, should, what are we going to do if those assumptions don't hold? Yeah. And I think this could really help with, with and that. And that point I completely agree, because it helps go from um, assumptions into a more independently verified um, where are the bottlenecks? Where are the actions? Where where is our our issues? And in that way, they can be mutually reinforced. So absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, follow up questions. Yeah, I'll follow up and I'll, and I'll check online again. 
Well, the, the, the solar application is, uh, it's about the, 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 um, the scaling as, as, a, as, a, as a research question, the science of scaling, uh, which was at, uh, on the table at some point in, in Italy or in Life of CRP, which has been more like on the back burner right now. Um, <laughs> again, thinking about, uh, with the end in mind, about the research questions that would, uh, you know, if we want to, to overlay <laughs> on that uh, scaling um, uh, diagram for the diagram, some research questions, yeah, I think it would do as well the time. As a, we should not do everything at the same time, I agree. But it may be interesting to have a few people brainstorming on what would then for be this science of scaling based on that process that you are suggesting here. And I don't want to complicate because mm -hmm. many things at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it could be an interesting thing. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, my, my initial quick reaction to that is that um, this is initially very focused on the scaling needs. Um, so the practice of scaling more than the science of scaling, so to speak. Um, having said that, one of the objectives of the Impact at Scale program, in the fact that it goes closer to the development side, is that there would be insights there that feed back and help us come up with new and better research questions and so on. And so in, in its design, this is, this is, uh, what we're supposed to be doing. And so, um, again, maybe not the first thing to do in the first year, but uh, in, in principle, yes. It, it would be very worrying, in fact, if we had really concrete decision support, you know, uh, insights coming up from this, and they don't translate somehow into our, our future research questions and how we do things. Because it would mean that basically we disregard whatever happens and we keep doing our thing. So I, it can happen, yeah, yeah. but... But yeah. Okay. Any, anyone else online wants to come in? Please do so. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I want to ask a question at some stage. Okay, Alan, please go ahead. Um, yeah. You know, when I was looking at Mark's presentation, I was quite impressed by the way that they kind of done a systematic inventory of innovations across IATA that that might be right for, for scaling. But to what extent have we done that across the um, Do we have a kind of list of innovations which have been met in the year and there's been various um, attempts to do that? Yes. So, I mean, currently we do not have that, but one of the main reasons behind this is precisely to have that. So it's not just listing what we have in terms of the it was also the comment on 400 innovations ready to be taken off at the CGIR level. I think it's a little bit similar. We have our own list that we sometimes give to, give to investors when they push us for it. Um, but if I had to put my hand in the fire, I would say that, you know, um, my response would be a little bit similar to what Mark was. Um, and so I think that precisely if we go from 0% mapping today, what should be our goal in five years? Is it, you know, 50%, is it 80%, whatever the case may be. And this is something that we would need to discuss as an institute, IMC would need to guide us on, on the level of our ambitions and so on. But it is very much my hope that, you know, when we discuss this a few years from now, we will be able to, to show this as well. This is where we were in 2019, and here's the movement, here's the progress over time and the change in our portfolio. and really start to use that information in a in a way that, that can really help us design and, and execute better. So that's it's a big part of what my hope is will happen as, as a result of this. I was going to make a comment on that in my wrap-up remarks, so let me do it now because it's very relevant to your question, Alan. <clears throat> We've been asked three times, sorry, asked two times in the last three months by donors, what does they only have that's ready to go to scale? And of course, you know, I'll send an email to program leaders, we'll gather information, and we get a long list. I score half of them off immediately because I don't think they're ready to go to scale. <laughs> but we had, we had that experience with TAT. You know, there was a long list from LA, and in reality, most of them are not ready to go to scale. That's my judgment, of course, and it's, an obje it's a subjective judgment. I would, be, I would be much happier if we were in a position to make that judgment more objectively, and that's exactly what I think some of these tools can, can help us with. You know, so instead of me, you know, trying to persuade a donor that this is ready to go to scale just on, you know, what I've 
what I know and my gut feeling and so on. I think a much more objective way of, provide, of, of coming up to that list I think would be extremely, extremely valuable. And I hope we can get to that position fairly, fairly soon rather than have to make some kind of subjective, subjective assessment. And usually we're over optimistic yeah. about what can scale. Hi, this is Sylvia from Addis. Yeah, Sylvia, please go ahead. Hi. Yes, it's not really a question, it's just a comment. Um, so basically it is really interesting that all this uh, workshop and all this thinking is happening now. As part of the work we do under Agriculture for Nutrition and Health in the Food Safety Flagship particularly, I'm leading a cluster of activities which has to do with delivering impact at the scale. So basically there's a number of projects mapped to that cluster of activities, which are all those that are expected to reach millions. And this includes the More Mill project, for example, in Kenya, um, a project in India, also working with the dairy sector, um, Safe Food Fair Food project in Cambodia, Safe Pork, also in, in Vietnam. Anyway, a number of them that the expectation is that they deliver um, they develop technologies and test them, and they can, they can be delivered um, at the scale. So as we were starting to get organized to start doing some sort of diagnosis and, and going through a similar process that you have explained, Ido, on our project. Um, but obviously, we, are, we, are, we don't have the expertise, and we are little by little trying to learn. So it's very interesting that this is happening also at the same time for ILVI as a whole. So I'm just saying that I'll be reaching out to you to see how we can, you know, we can discuss how we can perhaps get your support on doing that and whether we can incorporate what we are trying to do within your plans for the next year uh, because obviously we don't want to do this just in parallel. Um, so as much as possible we should try to, to integrate. So anyway, just saying that I'll be reaching out to you to discuss that, okay? Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. I think I may have had another voice trying to call uh, Yes, please. Um, me here. Okay, me. Ildri Addis Ababa. Um, the discussions are quite interesting and uh, a, a number of issues have come up. I think, and this is a comment, not a question really, other than having internal harmony in terms of uh, understanding of what scaling entails, what tools we are going to use, how we go about them, I think at some point we also need to be engaging with our partners and our donors, having a harmonized understanding uh, of what scaling is, because there's no use of understanding scaling differently from what our donors want us to achieve, and at what point will this kind of discussions happen, and who is going to spearhead it? I don't have a, a simple answer to that, but I, I think part of the part of that discussion will go on in the next six to nine months as we develop our ideas for investing in livestock early in 2025. Uh, because the donors will want to see what, you know, what our plans are. How are we really going to deliver at scale? Not us, but with our partners. How are we going to deliver at scale? So I think that, that conversation will begin probably later this year or more likely early next year as we start engaging with a broader group of donors. They will want to, they will want to hear, you know, our, our ideas and our thoughts on this. And that's why I said having you know, Ida and I delivered a plan this workshop this month, so we can begin to think about this as we develop the, 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 initial, uh, the initial proposal by the end of this month. I mean, we want to have it all in place by, by the end of this month, but at least starting to think, think about it. And I'm sure that's a conversation the donors will want to have with us when we start engaging with them as a group in, in the first quarter of 2020. I don't think we've thought it through fully yet, but it, we've got some time to, to, to think that through and how we would respond to that question from our donors. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a really important question. I, ha I think I had one more voice online, and then I don't want Neil to get fine, and I'm going to wrap it up. You will have an opportunity to continue to engage in this discussion. This workshop was really just a kind of first step in a, in, 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 a, in a process. So was there someone else online wanting to come in? Yeah, no, I, I don't know whether it was me. Uh, 
I don't want to. Sorry, 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 sorry. Just, just go ahead because you've got the microphone. Okay. Sorry, Amos. I think I've overridden you again. <laughs> it's Peter again. Um, I I think it's just building a bit on what me was uh, touched on there. There's, I felt that throughout the two days, the whole question of partnerships somehow rather lacked prominence. We had Larry making a very strong point, and one which I would endorse uh, very strongly, um, that you know, engaging with these development threats, gaining partners early on in the project cycle is really essential. They should really be involved in prioritization, they should be involved in uh, to be uh, asked a question about uh, targeting, uh, and it may not be the actual partners, organizations who scale in the end, but representative partners at that stage will really help you to build your research around issues that are potentially scalable. Um, and I think on the other side, the whole issue of the research partners is these, if we, if we call them, you know, the whole art or the continuum kind of scaling process, we tend to disengage relatively early, and there are often opportunities that as technology scale into the sort of ether where our involvement in actually promoting them is less. But for us to learn about what's been happening and to look at refining the kind of technology, looking for sort of mitigating measures against problems that arise, looking how to strengthen future adoption. So I, 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 I don't see, it's going to sound like Chris is not really, the process diagram doesn't appear to have any mention of partners. Maybe it's implicit, but we should be experts of our partnerships because these things will not happen without long-term engagement with partners and learning from them about what we can contribute to the whole process. Sorry, Dick Garble, they must maybe can fit in now. Yeah, just, just quickly to respond, Peter, I mean, completely agree. I mean, you'll notice that ILRI is not mentioned in the diagram either. I mean, it's more like which which tools we use at which stage, but it's, it, it is indeed um, very much uh, clear implication that in all of these stages we will work very closely with with partners. I completely agree with with. Fair enough. But let's let's shout it from the rooftops and really yeah. Yeah. build the yeah. Yeah. Fair path, et cetera, equal representation of ideas, blah blah blah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Finally, uh, Neil, final comment, and I'll and I'll wrap up. Oh, Neil is. <laughs> no, I just, okay, you know, I understand why you didn't want to describe the 46 project, but I still think that there's not the same level of understanding about what we mean by going to scale and what are the innovations that are ready. Like, some of us, like me, I think like a tool, I don't know, I just don't see a tool going to scale and having the impact at the level, but some people see differently. I see I'm right or I'm wrong, I'm just saying, it would be good to make a one concrete example so that. Yes, sir. Is that what I was going to say? Is that, um, I mean, we've been, within the CRPs, we've been talking about product lines for a long time. And the whole concept was about these product lines to formulate innovation. So it seems a bit strange that it is still such a difficulty of defining what we mean with innovation after having gone nearly through eight years, six years of CRP processes and talking about innovations. I think you're, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good observation. We still, yeah, we still struggle with, with that. As you say, we've been thinking about it for five or six years. Um, I want to draw this conversation to a close. It's just a, it's just the start of a conversation. <coughs> Some of you may have been you know, wanting to come in or ask questions. I'm sure Ida would be delighted just, you know, We'll all be at this next week. You can catch him at coffee time. I know he's here organizing the video and other things to do. But, you know, send you an email, catch him, have a conversation, arrange to see him or, 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 you know, arrange to speak on Skype. If there are things that you want to raise that you've had an opportunity to talk about this, this, this morning, because our time's been limited, and I'm sure you would, would welcome that very much as we kind of try and refine some of these uh, ideas. Um, I hope everyone has found this, this day, yesterday afternoon and, and, and this morning, useful. We really wanted to kind of, you know, we could have spent much longer, we could have dived much deeper into many of the issues, but this was a kind of a first attempt just to kind of expose ILRI. We know we're doing things across ILRI, we're trying different things to scale out, and ADDG, and ACDG, and IDLI, and all, you know, and so on. But we don't necessarily learn a lot 
from each other in those processes. So part of this is about trying to get us up to a certain common level of understanding. And as I said yesterday, trying to uh, understand what else is going on out there in the big wide world from what, you know, Larry and people like Larry are thinking, some specific examples from the CG of tools that can help us. And you can see how he and his, and his team have started to think about how we can how we can use some of those tools to adapt to our specific circumstances. So I hope you found it useful. Um, I want to make a comment on the CG doing scaling. <laughs> you will recall that when we put together the second phase of the CRPs, virtually every CRP had a flagship on transformation and scaling. It might have been called something else. The ISPC threw them all out. <laughs> But the donors wanted them back in again, and the donors started to fund us doing that bilaterally. <laughs> bilaterally. So, so there's still this tension about, you know, what's the role of the CGIR? And we had a long discussion at the science leaders meeting in June uh, about that. And I think the, the consensus is that, yes, the CGIR should not be doing scaling in the sense of being out there actually doing the scaling itself. That, but we do need to be engaged in facilitating that process in engaging with those intermediaries that, that Larry talked about in his cogwheel diagram. And then the question arises, well, why is the CGR or CG Center leading this project? I would draw a distinction between leading a project and doing the scaling. Many of the projects that we're leading that are focused on scaling, we're not doing the scaling. All the scaling is done through our partners. We might, we, we might be like AVCD, for example, we're leading it, but we're not doing the scaling. We're simply facilitating it and managing the project. But the scaling is being done by our partners, whether it's government, the private sector, NGOs, and so on. So I think, you know, there is a consensus that we should not be doing scaling. But we do need to be engaged in the facilitation. And in some cases, we might be leading the project as a program, but that doesn't mean to say we're doing the scaling. So I hope we can kind of, <laughs> at least with an early, agree that that's how we deal with that, that question. And we had, you know, when we set up the Impact at Scale program, you know, we had long discussions and arguments in the board about, you know, what this is about and why is only doing this? And, you know, Jimmy and I had to defend it quite robustly against some of the board members' arguments. They saw it as mission creep and so on. But every centre is doing the same thing. They might call it. You know, something different. Mark talked about the IITA director, which Kendra Shield leads on partnerships for delivery. Basically the same, same idea. And every centre is doing, doing the same thing. So we do need to, we do need to engage. Um, and it's part of why we set up the Impact at Scale program. Um, we also need to think more about how do we ensure that we have the right management structures and incentives in place for this. And I think that's something we struggle with and something I struggle with in terms of um, if you look at our you know, staff performance appraisals and incentive schemes, we still haven't got that quite right in order to drive this forward. Now, you know, I've tried to introduce into the, 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 the scientist performance uh, criteria things like, you know, and, inputs and impacts and engagement and so on, but I don't think we've quite got that right yet. And I, I think we looked at all of it. How do we, how do we manage that better? How do we incentivize staff who, you know, want to do the science, but they want to get engaged in some of this, but they're not, this is not necessarily going to produce a scientific paper. But it's really important for everybody. So I think that as an organization is something we need to, we need to think more about and get that, and, 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 and get that right. Finally, every time I think about this, I can't help going back to, and we all do this, my own personal experience. If I look at the farm I was brought up on, between when I was born in 1956 and when I went to university in the early 70s, let's say 20, 20 years period, the amount of scaling and innovation was absolutely huge in that 20 year period. I don't remember horses on the farm. They'd been replaced by tractors before I was born, but not, but not long before I was born. Not, yeah, I mean, I think my father got rid of, rid of the last horse around about 1952, 53, about three, four years before I was born. When I was born, nobody made silage. It was all hay. By 1952, 63, no one was making hay. 
making he and Aberdeen share is a bad idea with a high rate of <laughs> It all moved to silence. The speed with which that scaled out was huge, and it was driven by many things. One of the key drivers of innovation in that 20 year period was the rising cost of labor. That's what drove a lot of the innovation. It drove capitalization, mechanization. That was coupled with lots of innovation going on in the agricultural uh, engineering field, you know, forage harvesters to make silage. Cattle breeding in the UK was revolutionized in 1963 by a change in government policy to allow importation of French, <laughs> French breeds. The first shadows came into the UK in 1963. Till then, you couldn't import foreign breeds. Within 10 years, you know, the black cattle in Aberdeenshire, the Aberdeen, so were all white cattle from, <laughs> from, from, uh, from, uh, from, 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 which drove mechanization. And of course, the, te the technological innovation was part of that innovation. But it wasn't really the technical innovation that drove it. It was government policy, it was uh, labor costs. But it was also supported by government policy in the sense that it was a very vigorous and, and well resourced extension service. But anyway, it, it wasn't the technology. The technology was a, a, a result of those, other, of those other drivers. And so, I know that the context is different in the countries we work in, but I think some of the principles are, are still still very, very valid. Um, so, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks very much to those of you online who have either got up early in the morning or stayed in the office uh, late. Um, as I say, I hope you found it useful. It's only the start of a, uh, a much broader uh, conversation. As Ido has said, hopefully by the end of this year, there'll be a more... Um, detailed document that will build on this and will incorporate some of the feedback that Edo has had. And maybe at that, at that point, Edo would be the time to kind of reconvene either this group or a smaller group to kind of just review that and, you know, the idea of having some input or a champion or champions in the programs would be a useful part of that process. So I think we would plan to kind of, while well, the conversations will go on in the next few months, but kind of have a stock take yeah. late this year, yeah. early next year, as we continue to refine, refine the plans. And I look forward to seeing many of you in Addis Ababa next week.